full. We, uh, we don't, that's something we don't deserve, but he gives it. We're going to look in Hebrews chapter 11 this morning, Hebrews 11, and uh, the subject is heaven. Um, you know, we, we sing about heaven. This world is not my home. Let me read this passage first, Hebrews 11, starting in verse 8. We're going to look at quite a few scriptures this morning and uh, some real, I hate to use the word classic, uh, scriptures about, about heaven. And this is one that uh, sets, for me, sets the tone. Hebrews 11, starting in verse 8, is about Abraham. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out not knowing whither he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in the tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. I think this was the lesson in the little children's Sunday school class this morning. It was about Abraham and then Isaac. Wherefore sprang there even of one, and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude, and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country, and truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country, that is, an heavenly. Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. I, I love that phrase. He's not ashamed to be my God. And, uh, you know, what a blessing that is. Like I, I started to say, you know, we often sing about heaven, but I find it interesting that when we speak about heaven, it's often with tears of sadness. You know, we talk about someone who's gone to heaven. And uh, that's because death is the entrance. And uh, God calls death an enemy. You know, that, that's still true. Even, even uh, as Christians, uh, death is an enemy. I, as I've aged, I've realized, you know, sin and death affects you gradually in one way. You know, life keeps taking things away from me. <laughs> I don't have a lot of things I used to have as a, as a, as a man. And, uh, and then at a certain point, life is taken from us. You know, for Christians, we do rejoice. You know, heaven is our home. We're looking forward to that. And uh, like he said, you know, we, we seek a, a, a different place, a different country. But the problem is that the entrance for us right now is, is death. And the Bible says the cause of death is sin, not just individual sin. Uh, we, we inherit sin. We inherit a sinful nature. Uh, we, we jump in and get involved ourselves. But, uh, you know, Adam, Adam and Eve, they, they sinned, and, and the Bible says we inherited that, that through them and from them. I was thinking about this, how that God gave Israel a constant reminder of how terrible our sin and, and death is in the blood sacrifices. I don't know if you've ever thought about it. I didn't realize for many years that when a person took a sacrifice to the priest, it wasn't the priest that slit that lamb's throat. It was the offerer. You know, it, it sounds terrible even to say that, you know, slit, slit that throat. But that was a constant reminder to them every day and, and for different ones, every, whenever they were offering a sacrifice, that sin has a terrible consequence. We see it in life as well. And you know, some people blame God for death. I've met people who, oh, my, my son died, or, you know, they've had deaths in, the, in their family, and, you know, if there's a God of love, why, why would he do this? And yet the Bible tells us very plainly, by man came death. You know, God gave us the opportunity. Adam and Eve had the potential not to sin. They could have not sinned. I mean, God knew they would, but... Uh, they chose to sin. And the Bible says in, in 1 Corinthians 15, since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. God became a man, Jesus Christ, and died for our sins and rose again. 
the second Adam, the Bible calls him. As in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. You see, in, in Christ, there's another side to death. Let me read 1 Corinthians 15. You can turn there if you'd like. And uh, verse 51 through 58, quite a uh, lengthy passage. 1 Corinthians 15, <clears throat> verse 51, he says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. Now, several times in the New Testament he uses that word sleep for death. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that's written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And what a different look at death here. He says death is swallowed up in victory. You see, in Christ, sin's sting is pulled. It's like a stingless bee. It can buzz around you all at once but it's swallowed up in victory. Sin's strength is overcome. Listen, uh, sin is very strong. We're, we're all affected by it every day. But he says, God gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, death still has sorrows. Yeah, you've probably been to the airport and seen somebody crying because somebody's leaving. I mean, we, we have sorrows about lots of things and uh, when someone leaves, uh, we sorrow when Christians die. But the Bible says we don't sorrow like those who have no hope. We know that there's something beyond. Now, turn, if you would, to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and, and verse 13. There had been a false teaching that had crept in the, the early church, particularly there in Thessalonica, that... Uh, that the Lord had already come and they'd missed it. <laughs> and uh, he's talking to them about it in, in various portions here. But 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13, he says, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. He's talking there particularly about the resurrection. Uh, we don't have to sorrow like those who have no hope. And even before the resurrection, you know, Paul writes in another place, absent from the body, present with the Lord. He doesn't tell us a lot about it, but listen, that's good enough for me. <laughs> uh, when we die, as Christians, we are guaranteed a place in heaven. And he talks about the comfort and the hope we have because of this. Let me ask you this morning. You, you personally, do you have hope? Do you have hope in, in Jesus Christ? Is it based on what Jesus has done? Or is it based on something that somebody made up? See, we don't, we don't follow cunningly devised fables. We don't follow clever stories. We follow this, God's Word. God has spoken. And God has said that there's a heaven to be gained and a hell to be spurned. And our hope is in Jesus Christ. That's the only hope that we have. And like, he said, like it said about Abraham, uh, we seek a country, a heavenly country, the place that God has prepared. Heaven is, a, is an incredible subject. Heaven is real. Spell it with a capital H. <laughs> uh, listen, it's a place. And I'm, I'm bound there. I'm looking forward to it. The Bible talks about it being God's throne, uh, His special dwelling place. When the disciples asked Jesus to teach them to pray, He said, well, pray like this. Our Father, and what's the next line? 
which art in heaven. <laughs> See, that's, that's what we're looking for. It's the place where God is. We pray to our Father, which art in heaven. Turn, turn if you would, to John chapter 14. The disciples had uh, been having some, uh, some problems, and Jesus had been talking to them about His coming crucifixion and how that Peter would deny Him and, and so on. But in John 14, verse 1, He said to them, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in Me. In My Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto Myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Listen, Jesus, if anybody, Jesus knows about heaven. Jesus left heaven's glory. Man, I can't imagine <laughs> you know, leaving heaven to come to this. You know, we, we love, you know, this, this is great. I love Fellowship Baptist Church. I love Queensland. Well, I've got to tell you, heaven's better than this, all right? <laughs> uh, he left heaven's glory. Uh, he knew all about heaven. He's able to tell us about it. Uh, Stephen saw heaven. You, know, you read in, in Acts when uh, Stephen was preaching and he was con con being confronted uh, for his preaching. It says this in Acts chapter 7, verse 55. He, that's Stephen, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. The Bible says they took him and, and they took him outside the city and they threw rocks at him until he was dead. His, his last words were, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their, their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. <laughs> he died for the Lord. He saw heaven. It's possible that Paul saw it. We, we've been looking in 2 Corinthians, and he talks about, I uh, knew a man, he said, I'm not sure, uh, but he saw heaven. Uh, it's interesting how little we're told about what heaven is like. Um, there was a song that was on my mind this week, Je Jesus will be what makes it heaven for me. That's enough for me. I, I was saying earlier, I was thinking about this because uh, I'm, I'm leaving tomorrow to be with my wife and visit with her family and, and so on, my family, then later. Um, I'm going to be going to Roswell, New Mexico. L let me tell you, I don't really care what's in Roswell, New Mexico, except that Doyle is there. <laughs> now, my mother-in-law's there, but... Uh, that's not really why I'm going. <laughs> uh, Doyle is there. And that's the way heaven is. Uh, be honest with you, I, I don't care what heaven's like because Jesus is there. And uh, I don't know, maybe God didn't tell us about it because we'd get too homesick for heaven. or I, I don't know. But he does tell us a few things. One of the things I can tell you, heaven won't be boring. Listen, our God is not boring. You want an exciting life, give your life to Christ. You never know where He'll send you or who you'll meet or what you'll do. Listen, the boring lives are the, those that don't know the Lord. Uh, look at Stephen, man. Uh, he had an exciting life. <laughs> he had, uh, usually we think ex exciting things are things we make it through, but he, I'm sure he talked about that in heaven all the time. <laughs> uh, the things that went on. The nature of heaven. Uh, listen, there's no harps and clouds. You're not going to be sitting around with a, you know, white all around you. Uh, it, it's going to be exciting. There's no Peter at the gate. And there's no judgment by our works. Uh, you, I'm sorry. I hope this doesn't disappoint you. You do not become an angel. <laughs> All right? Angels were created angels. Uh, you're going to still be you, uh, but you'll have a, a glorified body. Uh, we're mainly given a description of the new Jerusalem. Uh, look with me, if you would, in, in Revelation chapter 21 and 22. And I, I think this gives us an idea of what heaven is like. Revelation 21. Now, he first of all talks about this earth. He says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Now, the heaven he's talking about there is the heaven we see right now. So for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. Well, that's going to be strange. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven. Prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. Uh, 
coming down from God out of heaven. And it gives us a few ideas, I think, of, of what heaven might be like. In, in chapter 22, for instance, verse 1, and again, this is describing the new Jerusalem, but he says, He showed me a pure river of water, of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Boy, people puzzle over some of those verses. Let me tell you, uh, uh, God will make it all, all plain to us. It's going to be fruitful. It's going to be beautiful. It will not be cold and lifeless. Uh, there will be all kinds of things going on. Verse 3, there should be no more curse. Boy, just that, that phrase alone uh, is going to make heaven wonderful. Listen, we are subject to the curse now. Uh, we're all experiencing it in, in different ways. Imagine, no more curse. Uh, look back at chapter 21, verse 4. And here's what it's going to be like. God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the for former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the, th the throne said, I make all things new. What a blessing. You know, we, can, we get certain joys out of this life, particularly if you know the Lord and you have the hope of heaven. But let me tell you, there is a curse. There's a curse. In heaven, that, that'll be gone. In the end of verse 3, he talks about the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it and His servants shall serve Him. There's going to be plenty to do. We're going to be truly servants of the Lord. Uh, in verse 4, uh, he says, They shall see His face. I, I don't know what this means exactly, but His name shall be in their forehead. Probably just means that, I guess. <laughs> Uh, th there's going to be communion, there's going to be fellowship. Um, like we read in, in, in chapter 21, uh, he, verse 3, He will dwell with them and they shall be His people and God Himself shall be with them and be their God. And what a blessing it's going to be to be with the Lord, to be like the Lord. You know, John said uh, in 1 John, Beloved, now are we the sons of God and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. Listen, this is not what we're going to be. But we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. We can look forward to heaven and uh, the, the joy that's there. In verse 5, He says, And there shall be no night there. They need no candle, neither light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Now, there's going to be light in heaven. It's going to be the Lord Himself. Chapter 21, verse, verse 11 says, Having the glory of God, and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Uh, verse 22 of chapter 21, I saw no temple there, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. Uh, listen, you're going to ask, you know, what church do you go to? <laughs> are you just going to love the Lord? And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it and the Lamb is the light thereof. And what a blessing that we can look forward to heaven. Now, I, I, I don't know from that exactly what heaven's going to be like, but I know I want to be where Jesus is. And you know, we need to stop and ask ourselves, he, he says there in, uh, in uh, chapter, uh, uh, let's see here, where am I? Chapter 21, verse, verse uh, chapter 22, verse 5, the end. He says, and they shall reign forever and ever. They shall reign forever and ever. And we need to ask ourselves, who's they? <laughs> who's going to be in heaven? Uh, that's going to be important. In Revelation 21, verse 3, he uses the phrase, they shall be his people. God's people are going to be in heaven. Well, how do we become God's people? Well, he says, these are the people with his name on their forehead. And that's not now. now. You don't get a tattoo, all right? Um, God will take care of this when you get to heaven. But in Revelation chapter uh, 21, verse 27, he gives us a couple of things. He says, There shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination. Listen, there'll be no sin in heaven. Uh, there'll be nothing, abom uh, no abomination, no defiling, uh, or maketh a lie. Sorry, I missed that part. But they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. See, God's people are those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Well, who's the Lamb? Well, Jesus is the Lamb. 
When John the Baptist saw him, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Uh, in, in Revelation chapter 5, uh, they were going to open the book. And uh, well, they couldn't find anybody worthy to, to open the book. Revelation 5, verse 5, it says, uh, they said, Weep not. Behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, of the Root of David, hath prevailed to open the book. You see, the Lamb is also the Lion. <laughs> Uh, later on in, in verse 11, uh, let's see, let me get my, my verse right here. Verse 12, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Jesus is that Lamb. And the Bible says, Jesus Himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. See, that Lamb is is the way. In John 10, he said, I am the door. You know, it's only through Jesus that we can, we can enter into heaven. It's not through a, a church. It's not through good works. It's through the person of Jesus Christ. He said, by me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. He shall go in and out and find pasture. Uh, Jesus Christ is the way, that, way to heaven. He's the Lamb. It's the Lamb's book of life. It's not your book. It's not my book. <laughs> it's the Lamb's. And the Bible says to have our name written in the Lamb's book of life, we have to go to God through Jesus. We have to confess that we're, we're sinners before God. Uh, we need to call upon Him to save us. We need to believe that Christ died and rose from the dead. You know, just the simple basics of the gospel, that Christ died according to the Scriptures, that He was buried and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, that my sins were on Him. And the Bible says he, he writes my name in the Lamb's book of life. And listen, no one can pluck me out of the Father's hand. No one can take me uh, away from the Lord. But you know, it's so important that you know the Lord. Uh, we're going to talk uh, tonight about uh, working out your own salvation. You know, knowing for sure that you're saved. It's not enough to be religious. It's not even enough to have had a, an experience in the past. You can have an experience without getting saved. I knew one fellow, I met him one time, he, he thought he was a Christian. I don't know exactly how he worked this out, because he, got, he fell off his tractor one time. Um, that was his experience with God. Let me tell you, you can fall off a tractor without going to heaven, <laughs> without, without knowing Christ as your Savior. It's by faith in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. The Bible says you must be born again. And there's a, like any birth, there's a time and a place when you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. Uh, Jesus has always been the way to heaven. Old Testament, New Testament. He always will be the way to heaven. Uh, let me ask you this morning, are you saved? There, there's a verse in Ephesians, let me just read it to you, that describes Christians. Ephesians 2.19. Some of the songs we sang this morning, we're talking about Christians. Uh, gathering in heaven, that kind of thing. Ephesians 2.19 says, Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Let me ask you this morning, are you a citizen of heaven and a stranger and pilgrim on the earth? Or are you a stranger to heaven? If you're saved, it's because you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. If you're saved, are you living like heaven is your home? You know, that's, a, uh, that's just a, a very basic thing. If not, if you're not saved, you can be saved today. Your name can be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Let me encourage you this morning. Make sure. Uh, don't be in doubt. Have assurance of your salvation. It comes by faith. For by grace are you saved through faith. And faith is in this, what God has said. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the, by the Word of God. Romans 6.23 says, The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. None of the name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Only by the name of Jesus. Are you trusting Jesus Christ today? You know, you're going to spend eternity somewhere. It's going to be a lot longer than this. I don't think, it'll, I don't think time will weigh on our hands. The Bible does indicate time will be no more. I'm not exactly sure what that means. But anyway, uh, let me encourage you. Make heaven your home. Make sure of your eternity. Romans 10, 13 says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. 
Your trust needs to be in Him. Not in your works. Not in your baptism or your church. But in Jesus Christ Himself. You can be saved today. And you know, for the Christian, uh, what a day that will be when my Savior I shall see. When I look upon His face, the one who saved me by His grace, when He takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land, what a day. What a glorious day that will be. Uh, take your song books, if you would. That, that's page 91 in your song book. What a day that will be. Uh, that will come and, and lead us in this song. Maybe you need to trust Jesus as your Savior today. I'm going to be down here at the front. If you need to be saved, listen, come, give me your hand. Let us have somebody go with you. Come on up and uh, uh, let somebody go with you and, and show you from the Bible how to be saved.